Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight it's my great pleasure to introduce to you George Kraft. He's a professor at UW-Stevens Point and a state specialist with UW Extension Cooperative Extension. Uh, he was born in Chicago, went to high school in Palatine, Illinois, and graduated from high school in Cleveland, Ohio. He got his undergraduate degree and his master's degree at Stevens Point. He came here to UW-Madison after working at uh, the Department of Natural Resources for several years to get his PhD. Uh, and then he was able to get a professor position back up at UW-Stevens Point. So it's great to have somebody with three different connections to the UW system here. Uh, he's going to be talking about groundwater in the central sands, quite germane issue. For George, it's been going on only a decade or so. Uh, it's been in the news a lot the last week or two. Uh, I think it's going to be a great combination of science and public policy, something we do not too poorly here, which I really appreciate George coming down from Point to give us a talk on his research over the last 10 to 15 years. So please join me in welcoming George Kraft to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Thank you, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I've been looking forward to this since Tom first called me. And I have this very warm feeling, a very safe feeling. I, have, I, I think if I collapsed here on stage and Tom said, is there a doctor in the house, there'd be 30 hands go up. <laughs> Unfortunately, there'd be like six geologists and a bunch of biochemists. And then finally, uh, an MD or a DO would come up and it's like, nah, I, I just do livers. I, I don't have heart attacks. <laughs> Uh, so groundwater has been making a lot of news, not just here, but nationally, internationally. I kept track this week of what was, what was turning up in the, in the newspaper and in, in the news. So uh, Bloomberg News had a report in it that, uh, it, on its opinion page that India needs to get its groundwater house in order. There's overdraft going on in places there. Uh, too much water being used and, and, and the water's going to heck there. Arsenic uh, uh, killing people because they're pumping too much for agriculture over there. Our, um, our, our host Tom uh, sent out a, a, a note where he mentioned the Oglala Aquifer and what's going on in the western part of the state, aquifer covering multiple parts of the state. After years and years and years and years of, of, of warnings that this was going to happen, there's places in Kansas now and uh, uh, nearby states where irrigated farmers are giving up the ghost. They've, they've drained this sucker. They drained it way more quickly than they needed to. Uh, if you read the old book, Cadillac Desert, anybody here? Uh, you know, they talk about already in the 1980s, they figure, eh, we're gonna drain this sucker and the government's gonna bail us out someday. Well. Uh, it's, it's, it's draining and, and nobody's bailing them out. Um, Waukesha, you know, the reason for the, the Great Lakes diversion is because we're drawing too much water down in the uh, deep sandstone aquifer over there. And Saudi Arabia, that's been this is a few uh, months back rather than just the other day or this week. Uh, but Saudi Arabia, they did this experiment with irrigated agriculture in the desert, drawing water up from this aquifer that was you know, thousands or maybe tens of thousands of years old, uh, depleting it just in the blink of an eye, uh, uh, comparatively by geologic time, and now they're, they're shutting this down. So you know, we got a lot of issues uh, when it comes to groundwater. How many are kind of groundwater, at least aficionados here? <laughs> oh, come on, some of you are being, yeah, okay. Uh, being shy here. But okay, what's this groundwater stuff? Groundwater is the water underground in the, uh, in, in the pores in the, between sand grains or the cracks in the rock where it's saturated. I think you all have a feeling that you know that soil is, contains water, but it's, it's not saturated. But pretty much anywhere we go on in the earth, if we go deep enough, we'll hit the water table, which is the zone below which all the spaces in the uh, uh, geologic media is saturated with water. And this is the water that we can pump from wells. It's the water that also flows and supplies water to, 
to streams in, in, in this state, and I'll say it more than once here, it fills our lakes and such here too. So here's a simple groundwater system, and you know, we can complicate this, this sort of thing quite a bit, but the, the basics are, are all the same. We have water coming in from precipitation, and we have it flowing through the subsurface and discharging to streams. So in this case here, uh, if this were Wisconsin, we're getting about 32 inches of rain a year lands on the surface here, an inch or two might directly run off into a stream and, and leave a watershed that way. But the majority of it goes into the soil. Plants use quite a bit of it, about 22 inches a year, send it back up into the atmosphere. And if you've been doing the math here, that leaves about six inches, eight inches, 10 inches, depending where we are in the state, that seeps through the soil and becomes part of the, the groundwater, this uh, blue zone over here. Now, if groundwater just stayed still, we'd be in trouble. We'd be up to our eyeballs in it after a few years. Um, but the fact is that groundwater moves. So uh, groundwater, once it's in an aquifer, its sole purpose in life is to get the heck out of the aquifer and discharge to a water body. Usually um, a, a stream, but also you know, some of our large lakes. The so Madison Lakes, for instance, are groundwater discharge areas, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Winnebago as, as, as well. So here's our simple groundwater flow system here. Now, uh, audience participation question. If we had a depression in the topography here, a hole of sorts, I'm thinking maybe 20, 40, 60 acres inside that goes below the water table, what would we call this thing? A pond or, or a lake. Okay, and the uh, point of this here is that we want to show that our streams are indeed oftentimes almost exclusively creatures of groundwater, but so are most of our lakes. And as the groundwater does, so do our lakes and so do our streams. Uh, and so when we are in Wisconsin with a, uh, a very nice reporter in a, a cold trout stream from uh, the uh, Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, or we see many, many of the small lakes, uh, uh, and, well, mid and large lakes as well, in central Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, we gotta be thinking groundwater. Groundwater is keeping these things flowing. Groundwater is keeping these things filled. It's a single resource. So let's talk about now, not just the natural system, but what happens when we pump groundwater. And what I'm gonna say about pumping isn't to say that we should never pump groundwater. But what I'm saying is that there are, are trade-offs and there can come a point, like any resource, we're using too much of it and we have consequences that we don't want. And so there's two big wheels that control groundwater levels, as I guess as well as lake levels and as well as stream flows. The one big wheel here is, is precipitation or, or weather. Uh, wet years, we get more groundwater recharge, we got uh, higher, higher levels, we got more water in, in streams. Drier years, we go the other way. Uh, the other big wheel is groundwater pumping. And what groundwater pumping does, it takes the natural signal of ups and downs and it brings it lower. Okay, so that's what groundwater pumping does. It takes the natural signal of ups and downs and makes it lower. So if we take our little cartoon here and now we put in a pumping well here, and so it says high capacity well, but it really means it could be any, any kind of, of well. The first thing that you'll probably notice is that this water here that was going to the east stream is getting intercepted by the high capacity well and taken someplace else. And so that water is being, uh, is being deprived of, from the, of the stream. Now, if this well happens to be really close to the, to the stream and uh, we're pumping that well really hard, we can actually uh, induce flow out of the stream and into that high capacity well and, and dry it directly. Uh, the other thing that you'll probably see here is note that the water table is substantially lower in the uh, vicinity of the well due to the, due to the pumping that's, that's going on here. And uh, you know, a, a little appreciated fact is that when we put a new well in uh, and, and, and we pump the thing, it could take years uh, even if you're only using it a part of the year and all that, before the incremental of effects of pumping come to a new equilibrium, cause a new equilibrium with groundwater levels. It could be a number of years before that, that happens. Um, 
A kind of a more subtle point here, you could see uh, that there was a groundwater divide here where we didn't have pumping, where uh, a bunch of water go to the west, and a bunch of water goes to the east here. And the pumping of the high capacity well here is drawing water from the west watershed, if you will. We're actually shifting the groundwater divide over. And so a lot of people have a, a thought that while we're pumping groundwater, uh, we only have to worry about the streams or lakes that are down slope or down gradient of it. But the fact is, is that you know, we can also have uh, broad aerial uh, impacts from a high capacity well after it goes in. So subtle point and often is underappreciated. So this, you know, I'm big being extension guy. And what kind of messages can you pretty much take to the bank and it's gonna be right 99% of the time? Uh, groundwater pumping always lowers water level somewhere and it diverts discharge from somewhere. Usually that's from, from streams, but again, bigger lakes like that too. So let's do just a little overview of the pumping situation in, in Wisconsin. We have some 7,500 uh, high capacity wells in the state. Uh, the red dots here are ones that have been put in since the year 2000. So you can see that these are rapidly expanding, uh, the, the numbers of these. Most of the wells in the state are used for uh, irrigation purposes, and it's also where um, you know, virtually all the growth of, of new wells is, is for irrigation. You know, it's funny, we don't think about ourselves as an irrigated state, but we're rapidly going that direction. Uh, central Sands then is this area here. Uh, I would say the main body of the Central Sands covers parts or all of uh, six counties. Um, and, and we know what's going on there pretty well. We also know because we have a lot of excellent hydrologists in this area. We also know pretty well what's going on in, in Dane County and I, I suspect also in the southeastern part of the state. But there's all these places in Wisconsin where we have lots of high capacity wells uh, that have been developed or are going in right now. We really don't have a clue. Uh, we, we haven't taken a look to see what the impacts are. And, and we should. You know, for many, many, many years, uh, getting a high capacity well permit uh, or approvals, they're called, was easy as filling in the paperwork, paying a very modest fee, wham, bam, you got the, you, you got the approval to put in a high capacity well, and that approval was given. Whether or not you're going to dry somebody's well up, whether you're going to dry uh, a lake up, or whether you're going to dry a stream up, it was an automatic. And it's only been in the very last few years where we've been starting to take a look at the impacts of wells, particularly multiple wells, before these approvals get issued. And the state legislature seems very busy trying to overturn that modest amount of protection right now. And we'll talk about that later. So let's move along to the Central Sands. The Central Sands, oh, we're about uh, from north to south here, about 80 miles, and west to east, Oh, maybe 50 miles, something like that. You can see that it's a, a region that's very rich in surface waters. There's some 600 miles of stream. Many of them are, are trout streams and oh, at, at least 100 lakes that are uh, 25 acres or more. And then when you get to smaller kettle hole lakes and wetlands and that sort of thing, there's a whole bunch more. What makes the Central Sands the Central Sands is that the glacial geology here is typically 100 to maybe 300 feet of sandy material over um, some uh, less permeable bedrock. So the aquifer for the region is, is mostly held in the, uh, the sand deposit and it's something that's very easy to pump and to get high volumes of, of, of water from. The, um, the, the part of the hydrology that drives the lakes and streams and everything else is the groundwater part, the underground part here. So in the slide on the right hand side here, these are the elevations of the, the groundwater table here. So all over the central sands we have precipitation coming in and it causes, just like we saw in that cartoon, it causes a, uh, a rise in the water table kind of in the middle and we got uh, a flow going to the west and we got flow going to the east. Again, this water, its, it's sole purpose to get the heck out of the aquifer uh, by the easiest means possible to, to a stream and leave the system. 
along the way, any times it hits a depression, by golly, we have a lake. And at the headwaters of these things, we have some phenomenal uh, cold water ecosystems, uh, brook trout, you know. Uh, the, 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 the magic thing here is, well, brown trout and the, uh, uh, the ecology that keeps all those things alive. So the central sands uh, view from the air. In the middle, we have the ma main irrigated region here. It shows up quite apparent. To the uh, west here, we have a mixture of, of dry land, woodland, uh, kind of agriculture, but some irrigated stuff sprinkled in. And to the east, we have uh, dry land uh, agriculture, uh, forest, and uh, a, a mixture of uh, irrigated land moving out there as well. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm working on telling the story as kind of a, uh, a, a chronological narrative. So let me see how I do here. So in 1930s already, we, we have irrigation starting in the, in the central sands, but this is mostly from surface waters or from pits. You know, uh, the way I picture this, and I, I talk to some uh, farmer friends that say, yeah, that's about what it's like. You know, these are uh, guys, because it was mostly guys, finding old engines uh, from a Model T or, or something like that, hooking them up to a pump and uh, distributing water over fields that were pretty close to, to streams or pits that were uh, shallow enough to groundwater you could, you could pump out of there. Um, this proliferated through the 30s and 40s, and by that time, uh, there, there was a lot of conflict because farmers were drying up streams by directly pumping water out, out of them. And people were kind of getting ticked off that their, you know, their stream is dry, their uh, fish are dead, and that kind of thing. The Attorney General's office worked uh, aggressively at that time, saying, you know, it's a violation of the public trust doctrine for water management in Wisconsin. You can't do that. So they instituted a permitting process. They kicked, you know, a bunch of people out of, of, of pumping from the, uh, the, the streams. Um, and then we get into the 1950s here. The surface water irrigation almost entirely disappeared. And there are a couple of new technological developments here. First in well drilling. And secondly, in um, you know, these, these machines that can irrigate large acreages by spinning around in, in a circle. You know, we learned how to fabricate aluminum in World War II, and this was one post-war use of it. Um, so there's a bunch of, of wells going in, and then in 57 to 59, lots of debate and discussion on water and groundwater pumping and that sort of thing. And by the way, you know, for those of you that are historian kind of folks, when you go back and look at how well these issues were uh, discussed both in the legislature and in uh, the, the, the Milwaukee Journal of the, the day. This, this was covered very closely. Um, it's the wonderful kind of uh, journalism that you know, we, we don't have the resources to see anymore, I'm afraid. So, okay, 57 and 59, we have the, the things coming to a head. And here's two bookends, I think, for the groundwater discussion. One of them, you know, uh, advocating a go-slow approach. We don't know what's going on here. Let's take it slow. Uh, and these were the conservationists of the day that were suggesting they weren't asking for anything that onerous. They said, hey, you know, let's issue permits and keep an eye on things, you know, measuring stream flows and that sort of thing. If we have unintended consequences, we'll slow this thing down. Uh, and, and then this was the, the other side of, of the discussion here. Um, actually, the, the people on this Ag Water Conservation Committee, you know, a lot of them are still around today, uh, although much, much aged here, but, but we still see these same arguments. Wait a second, no reasonable person cares about this. This isn't an issue. Uh, there's all kinds of water here. What are you talking about? And you know, we just don't have the information. We need another study or something, right? Um, and, and we still hear echoes of, of this today. So, I mean, you know, this is like the cigarette debate. Remember 1950 already? You know, we knew cigarettes, uh, cause cancer and you know it took us decades before you know we, we uh, reached that tipping point where we did something about it. Uh, point being here that we got to 1959, go to the legislature, ask them for a groundwater management bill which we could have had at that time. Uh, they were convinced now we don't we don't want to go in this direction. Okay. Uh, and then we didn't do anything with groundwater. I gotta check my math here. 
uh, but, but getting on 45, 50 years. Uh, so, you know, in that time, we went to 1950, we had two high capacity wells. 1960, we were, we were getting close to 100. Well, uh, now some scientific things are starting to happen in parallel here. So the Little Plover River is uh, said to be the most studied stream in the country. And I don't know that for a fact, but I've added to that pile of research. My good friend Ken Bradbury you know, is, is completing another study on that where you know, we've been uh, replowing some old ground and adding to some things. But this was a guy named Ed Weeks did this, released this study in 1965. Uh, and, and this is a famous USGS kind of kind of a guy. It must have been when he was still cutting his teeth. Um, and, and he showed the the groundwater surface water connections here. He mapped groundwater flow in the area. He measured the you know, the stream as it picked up groundwater flow a, a, along its route. He did an experiment where he put a high capacity well right next to the stream, turned it on, and intentionally dried up the stream. Um, and then he also did calculations that said, well, if irrigation gets to this point, we're going to be missing this much stream flow. If it gets to this point, we'll be missing this much more kind of stream flow. So he, he did this kind of calculation. Are there any hydrologists here that saw the same as, famous film that was made of this research? Yeah, I figured. Uh, so th th there was a film made of, of this back in the day that you know, all budding hydrologists have had to see from, from uh, my era uh, to, you know, to make your education complete. Anyway, so th you know, this was some of the good science that was done in the evolution, another uh, canary in the coal mine maybe that we ignored. So we get to 1970 and we're getting close to 500 wells by this time, which if you remember is about a five-fold increase. Uh, Ed Weeks was at it again with some other accomplices here, but he started studying the, uh, uh, the, the broader picture in the central sands, the wells that were going in and what he was expecting to see in terms of impacts on surface water. So he actually measured um, in a, a different location when the wells would go on, the stream flows uh, went down. Uh, he measured water levels going down and then he started making some predictions. You know, when the landscape has X percent of the uh, it was X percent in the irrigated land use. We'll expect to see water levels down by you know, Y amount and this much less water in streams. The studies, the work that he did here could have served as the basis for a groundwater management plan. I mean, they were, instead of doing this stuff with computers, you know, they were doing it slide rules and pencils and graph paper, but he put out a perfectly good strategy back here in 1971 and tools for managing groundwater way back then. Um, so, oh, you know, this, this was Weeks' warning here. You know, basically, be careful, you know. Keep this thing managed and maybe you can have the, the best of both worlds. Um, this is east of Plainfield, and this is part of the area that Ed, Ed Weeks was studying here. So there's this series of lakes and wetlands uh, that go east of Plainfield. So the freeway actually is on the far left side here, and this would be maybe five miles uh, e east of there. Um, and let me take a close look here. And so you can see the, uh, a, a few of the lakes here. Uh, the upper left here, you can see there's a plain field lake, and if you can make out this writing, and maybe you can't here, but that's a 10-foot contour, it's probably 12 feet at the maximum. Here is the famous long lake here, uh, which you know had a reported depth by DNR of 14 feet here. And you can see we have some shallow lakes here, and probably things that were wetlands part of the time, lakes another time. Uh, a deep lake here called Lake Huron. Um, that you know might have been 40 or, 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 or 50 feet deep. And we're going to come back to this guy in a little bit. Um, but here's the little plover, and now here's those Plainfield lakes here. We went from the 500 high-capacity wells to 1980, we've, we've cracked 1,000. Um, 1990, we got 1,400. 2,000, we're up over 1,700. And then come middle of 2000s here, and we have problems. I don't know if you can see from here, but you know, it looks like this thing has been 
hollowed out, that you know, that that the landscape has been partially dewatered here. When I mean dewatered, I mean we're lowering the water table here. Let's take a close look, a close up look at it. So here we have that that Plainfield Lake, uh, which was what a dozen or or, or so feet deep in, in that USGS map, you know, it's completely toast. It's turned into a wetland. Um, this year in Long Lake, you know, it's, it, it, it's very low. And this is uh, a lake that it was a trophy bass lake. And my uh, assembly person says, huh, I used to water ski there when I was a, a kid. Uh, and you can see the, you know, things that were shallow lakes have gone dry, wetlands have gone dry. Um, you know, other lakes have turned to wetlands, and the deep, the deep lakes have just gotten a whole bunch more extra shoreline. Uh, so here's, here's some pictures of that. So you know, point being, by the mid-2000s here, you know, we, we, uh, uh, we had this slow motion uh, accident here where, bam, you know, we hit the wall, and now it's undeniable that, that we have issues here. So this is that Long Lake Oasis. This is all taken by a guy who bought his place there like in 2004, and in the next two, three years, he had a, a dry lake. Um, 2000, this is 2005 or 2006, so it's turned into a wetland. The fish are toast by this time. Sure as heck, you can't water ski there, right? Uh, this is about 2008. Here and you know the thing is, has turned into a meadow. I was there the other day, and it's the highest I've seen it in, in uh, a dozen years there. But you know I'm thinking there's about this much water in there right now, and I, I don't you know you could barely float a a, a boat in there besides a, a a canoe, but I don't think we're going to have any uh, fish there any any time too soon. It's just a very wet year. We had 40 inches of rain last year. Um, little plover. You know, uh, the, the, this, this stream that uh, was well investigated, not only by weeks, but also by fisheries biologists in terms of why it was such a productive uh, uh, trout uh, fishery here. It went dry every year from 2005 to 2009 and mostly flows what's below the public rights flow. Think about that as a healthy flow most of the time since then. Uh, this is Pickerel Lake in Portage County here. This is standing on the boat landing with now is about 80 feet from the water. Uh, there's a, each, each of these uh, lakes has a story and, and the reason I'm showing one after another is that there's a sense um, among some of the stakeholder groups that it's a Little Plover River and it's a Long Lake, we fixed those two things, we're all good. No, this is, this is dozens of water bodies, okay? Um, you know, there's a, the story here is that there's a camp for indigent children over here and they're losing their waterfront. Uh, the lake fish kills more often than it did. Wolf Lake, you know, this is where Portage County has a park. On a typical Saturday or Sunday, there would be families, you know, 100 people there, 150 people at, at any one time using the beach area. Uh, water level has fallen to so much now that um, you know, there's no sandy material. You go off the edge and you're down in the muck. So nobody brings their kid down there anymore. We, so we've lost that. It hasn't been usable since uh, for 14 years, according to the parks director. Um, uh, a dock to nowhere here on Pine Lake and uh, near Hancock. Uh, another creek that's gone dry. You get the idea. You know, this is a lot of water bodies that are involved here. Uh, so, this is kind of where I come into the picture, actually it's be just before the disasters. Um, you know, I'm an extension hydrologist and, and uh, some people on lake groups said, you know, we're, we're worried about these wells going in and, and our water levels going down. Uh, what do you think? Um, uh, I was kind of on the fence for a little bit, you know, but then we, we did have the catastrophic dry ups and my team and I did uh, a number of studies on this, uh, you know, peer view, blah, blah, all that kind of stuff, you know, to which added to the, to the pile are uh, Dr. Bradbury's recent report that should be coming out here uh, in a month or two. And, um, uh, you know, a graduate student's work where, you know, she reviewed all the data for the last umpteen centuries on the area, area and, and uh, published that as, as well. So, you know, among scientists, this is, this is quite well accepted stuff. Um, so, you know, 
What does a scientist ask himself when confronted like this? Well, yeah, maybe this is normal, you know? And so what do you do? Uh, do you have stream flow records? Do you have water level records for these impacted water bodies? You know, what do we have that we can look at? Actually, I was thinking, you know, there's probably people here that have careers in, I don't know, biochemistry and gene jockey stuff and all that stuff. Hydrologists, you know, and you got all kind of cool toys. Hydrologists have two things. We have, we have um, statistics and conservation of mass. You know, that's that's our two big things. Okay, we do some fancy things with satellites and and the like, but you know, basically we rely on conservation of mass and statistics to kind of do our hydrology, particularly forensic hydrology. So you know, we went looking for some records here. And these things are pretty sparse, but there's enough of them here. So here's a plover monitoring well here, and you go, wow, okay, this is really something here. It's in a heavily irrigated area. And look what it's been doing now for a few decades. Just nobody was paying attention to the, to the record here. It was up on a um, USGS site. And you know, one of the four, five, six monit long-term monitoring wells we have in the sands, we don't have a tremendously wrong, long record. But holy cow, does this turn out to be valuable. So, wow, well, okay. But fortunately for us, um, because the stakeholders say, ah, a little plover dries up all the time, okay? Uh, the USGS was monitoring the Little Plover River continuously from 1959 to 1986, which included some of the driest years of the previous century here. And you can see the water level is bump, bump, bouncing up and down, and don't worry about the exact numbers here, uh, but you can see the, this says 10. Uh, 10 cubic feet per second was about the average here. And you look at what we had uh, in those more recent times here when we're having these dry spells, and it would plot below the, uh, hey, this is the exact meaning of off the charts, right? Um, it, it, it plots below the minimum of this, this chart here for a, a good chunk of the time. So it's okay, you look at this plover data, a couple other water levels, this little plover stuff as well, and uh, you know, it's looking, something normal isn't going on right here. So you go, know, okay, um, and there's assertions, ah, we're in a record drought. How about that? Uh, then we start looking at precipitation records and looking at how precipitation used to be and what it is in the current time here. So, you know, we had very dry times in central Wisconsin and maybe more of Wisconsin from about 1946 to either the mid 60s, mid 70s, however you want to cut it. During this whole time, compared to the average, we were getting two inches a year below average on average. Um, versus the current time right now, the last couple of decades, we've been getting inch, inch and a half more precipitation than average here. So, you know, the, these uh, dry spells that we have in the more modern area compared to the past here, you know, this is, this is peanuts. We, we can't blame this on any kind of a record drought. Okay. Uh, in other analyses we're going on, is there something else with climate change and uh, more sophisticated kind of stuff? And no, we, we, you know, we can't pin this on climate change. The climate change has gotten wetter. Uh, so now we could say, let's go to areas where we don't have a lot of high capacity wells here. See what's going on there. So this is one of the, another one of the monitoring wells that we have. This is by Watoma, where there's some groundwater pumping, some irrigation, but uh, not a lot. And you can see we go from this very dry period here uh, of the 50s we see as precipitation increased, water levels went up, and then they kind of just go bouncing up and down. And we can see this in a couple other records as, as well, that this is what water levels did. So now let's compare this with the place where there's many high capacity wells. And this is one at Hancock. It's at the field station that you drive by on the, on the freeway here. Well, look at this. Wham, you know, we see this, this plummeting of water levels here. And actually this becomes the basis, the comparison of these kind of records, the Hancock one with another location, maybe, you know, 10 miles away or getting more or less the same kind of weather where we can start to make calculations of how much missing water uh, there is. And we use that extensively. Um, we can see the lake record is more sparse in terms of how often they uh, uh, measured lake levels. But a lot of times we could see the same kind of pattern that lake was bouncing up and down and then bam, you know, the last 25, 30 years, we get this steep kind of drop off. 
Uh, the other tool that, that we employed here is groundwater flow modeling. Uh, groundwater flow modeling is the 20th century. I didn't say 21st, but you know, it was something uh, already that we were using extensively in the 20, 20th century. We've, we've gotten a lot better at it. Um, to, to figure out the ins and outs of an aquifer here. So we used the uh, groundwater flow modeling e e extensively. We used it, first of all, um, to see if a pumping hypothesis is hanging together. So we could dispense with other kind of causes like record drought and all these kind of, kind of things. But we still want to see, can a pumping effect uh, be, be, be reasonably explain our observations here. But beyond that, we, we use the model to do a few more things. Um, estimate irrigation water consumption, fill in blanks among observation points. You know, we, we have maybe 20, 30 observation points on the network. What's going on between of those things? Uh, and perhaps most importantly here, projecting futures. Oh, here's a groundwater flow model, uh, kind of looks like. And what it does is we let the recharge come in, uh, come in, and this is divided up in all kind of little tiny cells, and we do little algebraic equations in each cell. And the groundwater flow model mathematically routes the water to these streams. And while it's doing so, it keeps us a conservation of mass, so how much water in versus water out. And it um, also tells us how high the water levels are in, in the aquifer. Um, so, uh, long story short, by golly, we could explain the, um, uh, the impact that we were seeing at our known observation points with a, a modest amount of water consumption on irrigated fields, like two inches, which is what the biophysicists say, you know, is in the ballpark of what they think the, the net consumptive use of, of irrigation is. Now, this drawing here is the drawdown map here. So it's the, how much did the water table come down like, like this here. Water table always comes, uh, it doesn't come down much, close to streams, and it comes down the most, the, the furthest you are away from streams. Um, and we, you see we have the, the border, border between Portage and Washer counties is where we have the most drawdown here. We very conservatively estimate it because you don't want to overestimate in this business. Um, that you know the, the maximum was here uh, in, in this region, and we're talking three, four, five feet. The reality is probably seven or eight, so and so. But anywhere within this yellow region here, uh, you can see noticeable changes in the, the lakes. Not that they necessarily all dried up or something, but you see the trees are way up here, and the, the water level is way down there. You know, and, and boat houses are way up there, and water's way down here. So anything kind of within the, the yellow here, we've had substantial uh, drawdown. Now with these, um, with the groundwater flow model, it's, it's harder to illustrate compared to a drawdown map like this, but we can, we can estimate how much water is missing in streams. So just to pick out a, a, a few here, a black dot means it's missing 30 to 44% in the headwaters, a red dot is 10 to 30%. Uh, biologists say, yeah, 10% is about the hit you can take without harming a stream uh, too much. So, you know, we were, we're able to make this kind of connection as well. So let's talk about where we are in, in the present here. So we, we've had more wells come in. So we've cracked 2000 in 2010, uh, 2200 in 2013. You figure there's probably another 50 or 100 in the area. Um, and, you know, again, most of these were done uh, put in without any kind of environmental analysis here. Uh, you can see how they're going here. The red is the ones that have been put in the last five or, or six years. So we're kind of moving the development of irrigation to the flanks of the original uh, irrigated area here. So we can expect that we're impacting uh, more lakes and, and, and more streams. Central Sands, we pump 74 billion gallons of water a year, 2013 being probably a typical year. Um, you know, and people say, well, let's put bricks in toilets and things like that. It's like, okay, come on. 85% of the water use is irrigation. Uh, that's the thing we have to deal with here. You know, we, it's, it's uh, uh, a, a brick in a toilet's not gonna help us very much. Uh, these three counties, uh, the Central Sands counties, pump a quarter of 
all uh, groundwater that was pumped in Wisconsin in 2013. Uh, Dane sometimes flips in there and bumps wash air out once in a while, so uh, particularly wet years. And this is what we, I, I wonder if you're gonna find this interesting. This is what we use uh, that irrigation water for. So you always hear about potatoes, you know, oh, potatoes need a lot of water, uh, all this. But look what the, the largest irrigated crop is. You know, it, it, it's corn, you know, that, you know, for, you know the statistics on it, 40% for ethanol, 40% for animal feed, 20% for high fructose corn syrup, right? Um, I, I don't know, uh, it, it, but it, it's, a, it's an eye opener to see what the uh, water is actually used for. Now let's move into the future here a little bit in our remaining time. And in the future here, um, we're not done yet, right? You know, we haven't shut down uh, a growth of high capacity wells and we're seeing that we're getting more growth on the flanks of the central sands. So I picked this region right here uh, on, on this map here, you can see it's be right in here where we don't have too many high capacity wells. And so what's, what might this look like in the future? So I'm kind of being like a junior Ed Weeks here, you know, like what he did in 1971 looking what's going on in Plainfield. I'm looking up here uh, what's going on in the Tomorrow River watershed, Amherst, Nelsonville, if you know the area. So this is what we did, you know, right now there's 113 uh, high, uh, high capacity wells for irrigation and 11,700 acres. Now actually this has grown some uh, since that time, including the, the high cap well that I have in front of my house. Um, and we, we said, what, where are the soils good enough and the land's flat enough and there's not too many boulders and things where we might be getting additional irrigated land uh, development here. And when we took a look at this, it was like, holy cow, you know, we could easily quadruple what we have today. And I'm not saying it's gonna to happen tomorrow or in the next five or 10 years, but just like, you know, Weeks did that study in 1970 and all of a sudden we fast forward to the mid 2000s and having these things. You know, we, we could be at uh, 400 and some high capacity wells and near 50,000 acres uh, in, in this area here. So then we can do, okay, and this is what groundwater flow models are for, what's the projection? Of, of, of what's gonna happen here. So, uh, you know, here on the left side are the drawdowns of, of certain lakes here. So, uh, as long as we were talking about county parks before, here's a, a favorite county park in Portage County, Sunset, and we might be two to four feet lower over there. Uh, these are uh, no parks here, but you know, a lot of people have residents and fishermen and things. You know, three to six feet is what we might be looking at. This poor lake here, which is already impacted, you know, could be, 3.8 to 7.9 feet. Another county park here, you know, two to uh, four and a half feet might be missing, okay? So, you know, th these aren't minor kind of impacts and if, they're, if we're talking wetlands here, you know, forget it, they're gonna, they're gonna be toast. Uh, now we could look at depletion of some streams here too. The red circles are the main stem of the tomorrow. Anybody kayak or fish the tomorrow? Uh, do so, uh, I think you'll really, I think you really en enjoy it, it's, it's a great kayak. Um, but you know, the, the main stem here, you know, the, the, at this point here near Nelsonville, 14 to 28% missing, nine to 18%, 11 to 23% is how we uh, capture that. The tribs really get hit hard here, uh, you know, 44 to 90%, uh, well, okay, that's just about completely gone, that, that little bugger here too. Um, so point being, you know, we, we need to think about how we're managing our, our water. So you may or may not be aware that there's kind of a, is it a quiet water war going on? Well, a water war uh, anyway. And let's see how we got into this. So before 2011, this is, again, I'm an extension guy. I like to make the message special and I don't talk about the, or uh, uh, easy to remember, and I don't talk about the one or 2% things, but pretty much before 2011, anyone can pump uh, all the groundwater they want and individually or with a whole bunch of other pumpers dry up any lake or stream or wetland that they want to. Okay, uh, 2011, there's a case that went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, uh, uh, told the Department of Natural Resources, hey look, you have a public trust constitutional obligation. When somebody tells you 
that a high capacity well is going to harm a water body, you have to look at it. Um, the Department of Natural Resources minimize that at the time and say, well, we're only going to look at these things one at a time here. So if there's 20 uh, wells that have already taken a water level down this much, which was exactly the case uh, in, in this, another court case that went forward, and there's a couple of more wells proposed that'll take it down this much more, the Department of Natural Resources, well, it's only this much more, you, go, you know, you get your permit and go on. Well, so there, there was a, a, a legal proceedings on that, because, you know, this much more, this much more, this much more, this much more, you have a dry lake. Uh, and the hearing examiner said, no, DNR, you have to look at the cumulative effects here, too. Um, so since that time, uh, in, in the legislature, there's been uh, action to minimize or overturn uh, those, those legal proceedings here and pretty much go back to the Wild West days here. Um, two things that came out in the last session here, SB 239, which would uh, very unusually say that anybody has a high capacity well, uh, you get a forever approval, which basically is privatizing the public water here in, a, in an odd sort of way. We, we haven't done that before in Wisconsin. Uh, this other bill went further, it gave a permanent water right, but it rolled back all these protections from cumulative uh, impacts and multiple wells. So we're basically gonna go back to the uh, Wild West days. The other thing that was curious about this is set up this kind of politically insurmountable process where the legislature could designate an area and it would get studied and then perhaps, you know, uh, there would be some action taken to ratchet back the pumping in there. Uh, so it's sort of like, you know, while you're trying to fill in one hole, we're going to be digging a lot more holes and creating more problems, probably faster than we're going to be fixing them. Um, right now, you may be aware, whoop, I didn't want to do that, but that's okay. Uh, you, you may be aware that um, the legislature asked um, the Attorney General's office to... Um, uh, see if uh, the, the actions that happen after the Supreme Court ruling prohibit the Department of Natural Resources from doing any more um, well reviews based on environmental uh, impact. And so the legislature passed um, a, a statutory change that, that said, hey, if the Legislature doesn't tell a state agency explicitly to do this or to do that. Assume you can't. And since kind of that came through the courts, um, DNR, you can't do that because we already prohibited you from doing those things. So we'll see where that attorney general's uh, opinion goes, what the Department of Natural Resources decides to do with it. Uh, and I, you know, I think lake groups and river groups are back to having bake sales and that sort of thing to raise legal funds to, uh, to, to push back in, in the courts. It should be an interesting time. Uh, that's all my prepared remarks. Uh, Tom, I could take a few questions. That'd be great.